Testing. All right, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome back from the break, CS4510 L13B. Uh, the point of today's lecture is, is to flesh out the um, undecided, uh, theory of undecidability. Uh, and the, it's titled uh, Rice's Theorem. And uh, PCP. So basically, uh, Rice's theorem is about how every basically everything you would want to know about Turing machines is undecidable. Um, so everything about Turing machines, not just EQTM, ALTM, ATM, uh, ETM, and so on, is undecidable. But everything else is undecidable. And then PCP is an example of one undecidable problem that has nothing to do with Turing machines. Just to prove that it's not only the, th the only things we don't know are the things about the Turing machines, but in fact, there are uh, other problems that are undecidable. So uh, recall that we just proved uh, ATM, uh, ETM, uh, EQTM, uh, HALT. These are all undecidable problems. Uh, these are languages consisting of machine encodings, and we prove these are undecidable. Using this green marker. Um, and we prove these are undecidable by relating them to each other or by doing diagonalization. The one thing they have in common, though, is that these are all problems about um, Turing machines. Uh, Rice's theorem basically says. Uh, in, in no short words, all uh, non-trivial uh, semantic properties of Turing machines are undecidable. So first off, what does non-trivial mean? Non-trivial a non-trivial property is a, tr is a property that not every machine has or hasn't the property, okay? Consider the property of Turing machines such that, every tr that the Turing machines are a Turing machine, okay? Every Turing machine is a Turing machine, so every Turing machine has the property. Um, the property is non-trivial if there exists a Turing machine with the property and there exists a Turing machine without the property. So it's not total, right? If, if, if it was total, then it would obviously be decidable, right? Uh, a semantic property is one that is about the languages uh, and not uh, the machine itself. So this intuitively means like you have to turn on the machine in order to determine the semantic property. Uh, for example, M has 17 states is not a semantic property because you can just simply count the states. However, um, the set of machine encoding such that M recognizes a language which is recognizable perhaps by another machine with 17 states, is a uh, semantic property, right? So like uh, another way to think of this, if uh, L of M1 is equal to L of M2, uh, both M1, M2 uh, have or haven't uh, the property. So Rice's theorem is really about the recognizable languages. It's not really about the Turing machines. But we can only talk about the recognizable languages through the finite description, which is the Turing machine encoding. So we talk about the languages through the, language, for the, through the Turing machines. So what we need to prove is P is a class. Excuse me, P is a language of machine encodings, such that M is a machine has, quote, the property. Uh, if M has the property, I claim for any P such that the property is both non-trivial and semantic, P is undecidable. Uh, there is a little bit of data structures fiddling because ETM is the only language that we've proven that has this, is this the language of encodings of the machines. Uh, ATM and HALT are machine and word pairs. EQTM is pairs of machines, right? But these are all certainly semantic non-trivial properties, right? Because there exist pairs of machines which are equal and pairs which aren't. Um, this is just a simplification, and if you wanted to apply it to those uniques, a little bit of data structures work, but it's fine. Certainly, as immediate application of this, if we can prove this, 
We, it also proves ETM is undecidable. It also proves any other of these other languages are undecidable. Like, um, I don't know, let's say M is a machine and the language of M uh, is finite. So maybe the string only accepts a finite amount of machines. Excuse me, maybe the language only accepts a finite amount of inputs. This is undecidable. It's a weird language, but it's also undecidable by Rice's theorem because there exists a machine which is, there exists a machine which does accept a finite amount of strings. There exists a machine which doesn't accept a finite amount of strings. So certainly it's uh, undecidable. Similarly, any other property of the Turing machines you can come up with which is semantic and non-trivial. Let's say the size of the language is greater than 1,000. Okay? That's semantic and non-trivial. Or let's say the machine only accepts even length strings. Or we could say like uh, W is in uh, L of M uh, if and only if uh, WR is in L of M. So the machine is closed under reversal. The language except is closed under reversal, right? Any of these properties are all going to be undecidable by Rice's theorem. So you get for free everything, basically. Yeah. How, how do you know the property is semantic and non-trivial? Heuristically. It's non-trivial. Actually, that one's not heuristic. It's non-trivial if, it if there exists a machine with the property and there exists a machine without the property. That's all it needs. Like, you can't, if everything, for example, um, if I did, here's a, here's a bad one. L of M is greater than or equal to zero. Every machine accepts a language with more than zero strings, zero or more strings. Even the empty language has equal to zero, right? This is, an, this is a trivial property because it's always true. Therefore, it's always decidable, right? Um, but if I change it to this way, suddenly now it's non-trivial because the empty language hasn't the property. Any other language has a property, right? Um, it's semantic it, kind of heuristically if it's about the language and not about the machine. Heuristically, testing it to determine the property requires turning on the machine. I also like to think of it this way. If both M1 and M2, uh, if, if the languages are the same but the machines are different, then both the machines better have or haven't the property, right? Um, I want to give you a warning, though, because most people don't teach rice this name because it's dangerous. You're, on an exam or on a homework or whatever, if you're asked to prove something that's undecidable, you're supposed to do a reduction. Rice's theorem makes all these reductions trivial. It just kind of like waves you. You can basically write down the language and then say, you can just check the property semantic and non-trivial, and then you can conclude by Rice's theorem that it's undecidable, QED. I mean, that's how easy it is. But it's such a powerful tool that people misapply it all the time. So it's dangerous. So don't, don't you know, you sometimes tools come with warning labels. They should. This is an example of a tool that should come with a warning label. This theorem is so powerful, uh, you would never need to learn how to do a reduction. But it, it's informative that you know how to do a reduction. The, 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 art, the idea of the reduction itself is more important than relating undecidable problems to each other. So don't apply this on accident and, and get confused. It, it happens there all, all the time. So how are we going to proceed by proving P is undecidable? Uh, all we're going to do is um, uh, perform a reduction. We're going to prove... To prove P is undecidable, we're just going to prove uh, that uh, there is a reduction from ATM to P. And P is the property, language with, of machines with the property, right? That's sufficient to show. And if we do this proof general enough for any property P, uh, we're good, right? So first, uh, some assumptions. Since uh, P is non-trivial, Uh, there exists, uh, we'll say, M1 in P and M0 uh, not in P, right? So let's just call M1 a machine with the property, and let's just call M0 a machine without the property. Fine. Uh, without loss of generality, suppose that the empty set, uh, that empty set has the property. No, excuse me, hasn't the property. Um, why doesn't it matter that we can assume without loss of generality that the empty set hasn't the property? If the empty set had the property, we can just prove P complement. And then now the empty set hasn't this other property. 
And then by showing that's undecidable, then P also has to be undecidable. Right? So we give a decider for ATM. Uh, a, uh, I'll write it over here. Uh, a on input uh, M comma W. We're going to say build uh, M, what do I call it, prime hard-coded from uh, M, W, and M1, which is the machine with the property. Uh, if M1 has the property, excuse me, M prime has the property, we accept, uh, else we reject. So now we need to build M1, M prime, to have the property only if M accepts W. So M prime is going to look like this. On input, what do I call it? X. M prime has M hard coded. It has W hard coded. And it also has M1 hard coded, right? We're going to simulate M on W if it accepts simulate uh, M1 on X. Accept X if M1 does. So here's the big difference between all the other kind of machine programs and other machine to simulate a third machine proofs that we've done so far. What's going on here is that instead of doing some arbitrarily ungeneral behavior, M prime is quite literally going to be M1. M prime is going to pretend it's M1. So M prime is going to force itself to have the property. M prime is going to pretend it's M1. It's going to pretend it has the property. By simulating L of M, excuse me, by simulating M1, it's doing whatever M1 is doing. M1 has the property. That's, it's going to pretend it's M1, and then it's going to be semantically equivalent to M1, except the same strings. Only if M accepts W, though. M does not accept W, then L of M prime is going to be the empty set. So, and that, by assumption, without loss of generality, does not have the property. Right? So basically, um, M prime is in P. Suppose M prime is in P. That's true if and only if M prime, the behavior of M prime is equal to M1. There's a lot of M's going around, I know. Okay, agree with that step so far. It has a property only if it's pretending to be M1. And it only pretends to be M1 if M accepts W. Uh, and M accepts W, then we know that M comma W is in ATM. Loudest, squeakiest marker. Can you guys see that? Is that clear? Is it green? Fine? Okay. It's not my marker. So, um, Similarly, if M prime uh, was not in the property, that means that M uh, did not ever reach an accept call. So it just doesn't accept anything. Uh, to accept a string, the ex accept instruction has to be explicitly said out loud. So M prime not having the property means that L of M prime is equal to the empty set, um, which means that, uh, well, actually, I said, uh, this means that M uh, rejects or loops on W, which is true if and only if uh, M comma W is not in ATM. And we've concluded that for non-trivial semantic properties P, uh, that P, there's a, a, a many one reduction from ATM to P. We can conclude that P, therefore, is undecidable. So any property you can think of is going to be undecidable for the same reasons here, right? Here, all these proofs look the same. What ends up changing is here is, is this part where you simulate M1. M1, you pretend to do something that M1 would do to force yourself to have that property. Um, certainly. So... 
Uh, theorem, Rice's theorem was named after a guy named Henry Gordon Rice, who did it as his thesis, and then I don't think he did anything else afterward. I think it was an, he went to industry or something. Um, but it, it, this was a lot harder to do back in the day because they didn't have any programming languages or anything like that. They didn't know you could have, we have data structures and conditionals and if statements and all these kinds of crazy stuff. They were working in a purely functional notation. It was not obvious that a machine could encode another machine to simulate a third machine or anything complicated like this, right? Um, especially when you're working with it with like a functional notation. The fact that we know machines can do this is awesome. So it makes this proof very ex accessible to us. It's a very famous and very important theorem. However, uh, it's, 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 it's as simple as a problem in the Sipser book. It's like not super uh, advanced. It's, you, could, you could have probably figured this out. Okay, any questions on Rice's theorem before we go to the second theorem for today? Okay, the next problem is about a simple undecidable puzzle called PCP, uh, which stands for posts, uh, a correspondence problem. Uh, Emil Post was a historically unlucky guy. Like, he almost discovered Gödel in completeness before Gödel did, but he was beaten. And then he almost discovered Turing machines and the uh, undecidability of certain problems related to them before Turing did. Um, but he, uh, and he almost solved several other problems before anyone else did, except every single time he, was, he lost. Um, and then I think he was manic, and then he was electrocuted. Uh, electro electrocution therapy or something. And then he, he died as a consequence of it. It was very tragic. Um, anyway, historically unlucky guy, but he came up with really the first historic example of a puzzle or a little problem that has nothing to do with Turing machines, which itself is undecidable. So the idea is like given, I can just do the example to explain uh, what it is. You're given a set of tiles or dominoes, which have strings on the top. So let's say we're given this set of tiles. A B, C, A, 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 B. E A A or A B C. So here's an example of four tiles or dominoes. Each one has an upper portion and a lower portion, a top and a bottom. You're asked, you're given unlimited copies of each tiles. You're asked if there exists a sequence of the tiles which form a match. And by match we mean a concatenations of the of a sequence of the tops equaling the top the bottoms. So you're allowed unlimited, copy, uh, unlimited copies of each domino. And you're asked, is there a sequence of these dominoes such that the concatenations of the top in the order you give is equal to the bottom? So I have already worked out this example. And I know that this set does have a match. And it's 2, 1, 3, uh, 2, 4. So let me just do some copies. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So 2 is going to be A, B, A over A, B. 1 is going to be B over C, A. 3 is going to be C, A over A. 2, 1, 3. 2 is going to be A over A, B. And 4 is going to be A, B, C over C. Right. Um, now, if we write the tops and the bottoms together, what we're going to get is that we're going to get A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. And on the bottom, we would get A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. Right? But now, if I write these without commas, we get the same thing. We get A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. A, B, C, A, 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 B, C. So do we see how this set of dominoes, this 
two, one, two, two, one, three, two, four is a match for the set. So we say that this specific set of dominoes has a match because we can create copies of the dominoes in this way. We should draw the border of the dominoes, right? Given a set of dominoes, does there exist a match? This set does have a match. But there are some sets without a match. Okay? Here's an example of a set of dominoes without a match. A, A over A. In fact, you can prove this set of dominoes does not have a match. Just one domino, right? No copies of this domino. Let's, well, suppose every set has a match of no dominoes. So forget that. Does there exist a non-zero set of dominoes, sequence of the domino copies that has the top concatenations equal to the bottom concatenations. You can, it's obvious to see why. Why, is, why does no amount of copies of this one domino have a match? Because the top will always have more letters than the bottom. Exactly. The top always has more letters than the bottom. So this is an example of a, of a, of a set that has none. We give the language uh, PCP for post's correspondence problem to be encodings of sets of dominoes P says that P is a tile set and P has a match. Uh, PCP is undecidable, is algorithmically unsolvable. There is no algorithm to determine, given a general set of dominoes, uh, whether or not there exists a match or, or, or not. Right. So what's the proof idea here? This is weird because it's not about Turing machines. So the reduction is going to take the rest of the class. It's not obvious how you do it. Um, the reduction is uh, quite involved. It's going to take the whole class. Basically, what we're going to do is, given a machine in, in Word, we're going to prove the reduction uh, from ATM to PCP by given M and W. We're going to create a tile set that has a match only if m accepts w. The other idea to think of that is we're going to force the tiles, any algorithm which could choose tiles in any order to try and search for a match, we're going to trick that algorithm into simulating m on w for us. That's the idea. Um, uh, although this seems like a very, very, very simple combinatorial problem, it's actually quite expressive. In the amount of things you can do with the dominoes and with the things, you have a lot of power when you choose your set of dominoes by forcing any algorithm to try and look for a match. Um, that one seems fine. Um, So consider this set of dominoes. We have hash b hash, and then we have uh, a b. Any algorithm that would try to find a match with this set of dominoes, what do you what do you can, what can you guarantee about this set? There is no match. But it, suppose there was an algorithm looking for a match. If it did exist a match, we would know that the match would have to begin with this first dot tile, right? It's the only tile that starts with the same character. This tile set's too small to have a match. There's no match. But if there did exist a match, it would be forced to start with this tile. So by choosing the tile set correctly, we can force any match, if there did exist one, to start with a specific tile. Now, we start with this tile, OK? We can consider ourselves the algorithm as choosing them sequentially, although the algorithm can do anything it wants. We're trying to show there is no such algorithm. Any, let's say if this is the first tile, we also know something about the second tile. Because this is the first tile, the top is longer than the bottom. Whatever tile is chosen next has to have a B on the bottom. So we're, we can conclude that the subset of tiles we can now choose from to be the next tile has to have a B on the bottom. And by doing so, we can actually force the next tile by making sure there's only one tile with B on the bottom. We can now force the next tile. 
But now, because we've put in a B, so the, the string is going to go like this. We'll choose the first tile. We'll go hash B hash. OK, we now choose this one, A, B, right? The top is longer than the bottom. We need, a we need a tile that has A on the bottom. So if there's no tile with A on the bottom, of course, there's no match. But we, the next tile would have to be chosen that has an A on the bottom because there's this deficiency. The top has, is longer than the bottom, right? So consider if I added this tile, dollar sign, A dollar sign, canary, right? This is the only tile with A on the bottom. So of these three, this is the only one that could come next. So we put an A here, dollar sign, to dollar sign. And look at that, we have a match. So similarly as this is, we can force this first tile. By forcing the first tile, we can also force every next tile. And then we can also force the end tile. So what we're going to do is force the sequence of tiles that the algorithm chooses to be simulating the machine. We're going to force it to simulate the Turing machine by encoding the Turing machine into the tiles. So every step of the tile, the next tile is chosen, simulates a step of the Turing machine. Um, and then we're going to have an end cap. We're going to make sure that the, the, the cap only exists if uh, the machine accepted. So the only way you could have this end cap applied was if the machine accepted. So uh, recall what a computation history is. If we have a Turing machine, uh, let's say we have a Turing machine which just sees a 0, it writes a 1, or it sees a 1, it writes a 0, and it moves right. Or if it sees a blank, um, this. So if it sees a blank, it writes the blank and moves, let's say, what did I say exactly? It says it moves left, right? The sequence of configurations of this is going to begin at, let's say, Q0, um, 1, 0, right? What's the next configuration according to the Turing machine? It's going to be, uh, we're going to read this one and we're going to write We're going to read this 1 and write a 0 and move right. So this is going to be 0, Q0, 0, right? Then we're going to read the 0 and write a 1 and move right. So this can be 0, 1, Q0, blank. And the next one is going to be, we're going to read the blank, write the blank back, and then move left. So this is going to be 0, QA, 1, blank, right? This is a, the computation history. It's a sequence of this configuration of the Turing machine. What we're going to do is encode the sequence uh, as a string like this. Hash Q010, hash 0Q00, hash 01Q0 blank, hash 0QA1 uh, blank. So this is uh, a computation history is just a string that, is, it, that exists and is syntactically correct if the machine accepts the word, OK? This string exists and is correct only if this machine accepts the word, right? It is a, by, so if you can determine if a, you can have a, any device check the syntax of a string, that's sufficient for you to determine if m accepts w. You would just check the first one as a start configuration, check each configuration follows, and then check the last one as a configuration. So this string only exists and is correct if the machine accepts w. What we're going to have our do is our tile set match the top and the bottom to be that computation history. That's quite literally what we're going to do.
So our first tile, we're going to force it to be like this. Recall, the config recall that uh, a Turing machine computation is a sequence of configurations where C0 yields C1, yields C2, uh, which yields dot, 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 let's say, like a CA for C accept, right? It's a sequence of moves. A computation is a sequence of steps. What we're going to do is begin with the tile uh, hash on the top, hash on the bottom, C0. Right? Now, the, there's a deficiency because the top is less than the bottom. The machine is now, we're going to create the set of tiles so the machine is forced to pick the next tiles in the way we want. It's going to choose C0 in such a way that it's going to be forced to write C1 next. So basically, this is going to go after some steps. It's going to, finally, it's going to write C0 on the top to match the C0 on the bottom. But by doing so, we've tricked it, we will trick it into writing C1 here. Now there is another deficiency, because by writing C0 at the top, it forces itself, by forcing itself to write C0 here, we've tricked it into computing and writing C1 here. We repeat. It's going to be forced to write C1 here, and it's going to write C2 here. It's going to write C2 here, and it's going to write C3 here, and so on. And we're only going to be able to end the deficiency and add this cap. We'll have this tile that looks like this, CA, hash, hash, something like this. This tile can only be added to end the deficiency. It's going to be the only tile with the top longer than the bottom. Uh, it's going to be added to fit on the cap only if the machine accepts. So you can only add this cap if the machine accepts. That's the goal. So we're going to begin with uh, this proof conceptually is very simple, but it has a, has, a, has a ton of incredibly small uh, and obscure details. So we're going to begin with, begin with this tile. We're going to have hash, hash, q0, w1, dot, 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 wn. That's tile one. Okay. Next, we're going to add, we want to simulate for each right move. Let's say we were at qi. We read A, we write the B, and we move right. We go to some QJ. So this is some Turing machine transition. What we're going to do is, if we were at, we're going to add tiles. Uh, QIA is BQJ. Do we understand what this tile is doing? As it's forced to write the top configuration, it's, it's going to write the bottom configuration for us. This is a step of the Turing machine. If you recall the proof that we proved that unrestricted grammars were Turing complete, we noticed that the sequence of configurations really is a small substring update of each one. Right. That's basically what we're going to do here to encode, um, to encode this. Uh, for each uh, left move, we actually have to add uh, three tiles, unfortunately. So let's say QI, we read an A, we write a B, and we move left. We uh, QJ. What we're going to do is, like, if, if we're at uh, QIA, we want to read that, write a B, but then we move left. So what that means is we're going to have three tiles for everything that, that, that come, could come before. So QAB, right? So we read this A, write this B, and then we move the tape head left. So this is one tile. And it's only because we have an asymmetry in the way we've encoded the information. The tape head is pointing directly at the cell uh, that it's above. But when we write it, we just write it to the left of it. So we have, to ha we have to reckon with that asymmetry we've introduced. Here I'm just assuming you would have gamma tiles. Uh, for your gamma is the number or the size of gamma with the tape alphabet. So blank Q I A uh, Q J blank B. Okay. Everyone agree with these three moves so far? What they do? What's the point of them? Any questions so far? This is really the heart of the proof. Um, by forcing to write the top configuration here, it's going to uh, write the next configuration on the bottom. And this, this pair is, is, is exactly that match. 
The next thing to note is that computation is actually local, right? So like the tape may have 100 ones on it, right? Let's say we were reading in the process of beginning with 100 ones, and we have like 0, 0, 0, 0, let's say Q0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And we have a machine that reads the tape and reads the tape of all ones, marks it to zeros, and moves right forever. Um, the next step would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Q0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or something, right? So at each step, these are two sequences of configurations. At each step, only a small part of it changes. Computation is local. The rest of the tape remains unchanged. Actually, only around the tape head does the tape, uh, does the, do, does it, does, is there any change? Similar to the unrestricted grammar proof we did, why that was turning complete. So we need to copy the rest of the tape over. So we just need a bunch of helper uh, tiles for that. And they're going to look like um, A over A, uh, B over B, uh, blank over blank. We also need delimiters between uh, the configurations. So we're going to need hash over hash. And sometimes in a, in a sequence of configurations, it's useful if you have a blank only when you need it. So we're going to add a tile to introduce blanks for us. All right. So we, add, we now add these five tiles. We add one tile per right transition, three tiles per left transition, one start tile, and five of these helper tiles. There's a problem when we add these helper tiles, though. What's the problem with this? doing this? So A over A, if we add this tile, the set automatically has a match. You could just choose that tile as the match. So we've ruined the whole structure by adding this tile A over A. Yes? Do you have, I thought you always had to use all the tiles for your match. No, you can use any subset of tiles. I see. Yeah. That would probably be undecidable similarly, though. Right. Had to use all the tiles, right? Um, suppose we're using a subset of the tiles. You would want to usefully use all the tiles, right? Um, by choosing this match, it's uh, problematic, right? This tile is no longer forced to be the star tile. This, now every set with this tile has a match. We'll fix this later, but I just wanted to mention that there is a way to fix this. This, we still want to be the star tile, OK? These, we only want, only want to use intermediary, uh, like here, to copy the cells, right? Now we need a way to add the end cap on. And this is where it gets challenging. Because a Turing machine can accept, uh, if a Turing machine accepts, first of all, uh, then this, we know that a, a configuration is accepting as a string because it contains a symbol for QA. We can tell, tell if the machine is at an accepting configuration by just seeing if the configuration contains the symbol QA, where A is the accept state, right? QA is the accept state. You can tell if it's at the accept state or not. The problem is it doesn't have to accept with empty tape. It can accept with uh, tape still left over. Just throw garbage there. There's two problems with this. I mean, there's two fixes for this. One. Before you convert this machine to a tile set, you um, modify the machine so it erases the tape. Then you only accept with the QA. Then you can have the end cap as we've described. The way the book does it is first it moves the head all the way to the right. Then it adds these tiles. Um, a, Q, A, Q, A. Uh, B, Q, A, Q, A, space, Q, A, Q, A. Now, what this does is basically if the tape has a bunch of stuff left on it, let's say the tape was like A, 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 Q, A, so we accept with four A's on the tape. By adding these tiles, what you're going to do is basically every time there's a Q, A on the top, uh, you're forced to add to eat the Q, A, essentially. Right, so it, it kind of eats the string. And then eventually, after these redundant configurations, you will have like only a QA left. Right? This allows you to put the end cap piece on, which is going to look like 
uh, QA hash hash. This is the only piece that is, these are the only pieces which are longer on the top than on the bottom. And you can only add this piece to complete the deficiency. So as you, com as you compute the cells, uh, they're all going to have a deficiency, right? They're f you're, forcing the, you're, you're forcing them to add more cells. And to have a match, the tops need to be the same as the lengths at the bottoms. You only, get, you only fix this if you add this cell. You only will have a match if you can click this piece in at the end. And you can only click the piece in at the end if the machine accepts the word, right? So this is the set of tiles you have to make in order uh, to convert a machine into a set of tiles, such that the, t the, the set of tiles um, has a match only if the machine accepts the word, right? To reiterate the proof, you begin with this tile, hash, hash, C0. The machine is forced to choose tiles at the top, right? So um, for example, this tile begins with Q0W1. Okay. The next tile it chooses has to have Q0, W1 at the top. Maybe at the left move or the right move, right? It's going to, be the, it's going to have to be a right move, because I guess the first move can't ever be left, right? Because it's going to, can't ever be left correct to move off the tape. So it's going to choose the right move tile first, because it has QA, I on the top, okay? So it's going to put QA, Q0, W1 here. But by doing so, it's going to put BQI here. So it's forcing itself to write C1. In order to write C1, it's going to write C2, right? And only just, and so on, right? Then finally, to put the cap on, you need this piece. So that's the only way you'll have the match. <coughs> um, let me talk about how we're going to fix this issue, where we've introduced a tile that adds this redundancy for us. And it's kind of ugly. We don't really want uh, that to be possible. So let's use this shorthand, like... Uh, uh, for u is equal to u1 dot, 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 uk, we say dot u, or maybe I should do a star. We'll say star uh, u is equal to star uh, u1, star u2, dot, 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 we'll say star here, star uk. So the stars, star u is an operation that puts a star to the left of every symbol. Similarly, u star is going to put a star to the right of every symbol. And then star u star is just both. Right? Any ambiguity about this new notation I've just introduced? Just star u, u star, star u star, I mean, right? It's just a way for us to introduce symbols. Yes? How come there's for star u star? Should, should it be star u star and then another star, right? So star u star is the definition on this side. This is what it means. Star u1, star u2. Basically, if the star comes in before, the star comes before every letter. If the star comes after, the star comes after every letter. If the star comes both, it comes before bo both and after every letter. But there, there, there's not going to be two stars. So Definitely not. No two stars. Absolutely not. So now if we're given tile set, let's say T, S, uh, B, S, comma, uh, T1, T2, excuse me, uh, T1, B1, Uh, T2, uh, B2, uh, TK, BK, uh, TE, BE. So basically what's going on here, I have some set of tiles. I've just denoted all the other ones by T1 to TK, B1 to BK, where T is for top, B is for bottom. I want TS to start, and I want TE to end. I want E, S for start and E to end, okay? I want to force any match to be a match that begins with T, S, B, S, and end with T, E, B, E. So what I'm going to do is just modify this tile set in the following way. Um, 
The first tile is going to become uh, star TS uh, over star BS star. All the other tiles are going to become star T1 uh, B1 star. star T2, B2 star. And the end tile is going to be uh, star TE star over BE star. Right? So notice that every tile, uh, so notice, notice because star is a new added symbol, Every tile, the only tiles that start with the same symbol is going to be this one, because this one starts with two stars, star, star. None of these start with a star on the bottom or the top. They all start with something else. Star is on the top, no star on the, on the bottom, whatever B2 is, whatever that string is, A's and B's, right? But the top starts with a star. So none of these tiles, T1 to B1, uh, T1 to BK, T1, B1 to T1, TK, BK, are going to start with the same symbol. So none of those can be a starting tile. But, uh, and TE to BE is going to be an ending tile because it's the only tile that ends with stars, right? So th by adding this, we take our tile set, uh, construct it from the Turing machine this way. Then we double the straight lengths of all the strings by adding all the intermediary middle steps. And then by doing so, we've now forced the start to be what we want, fixing this little issue with the A. And we've uh, forced the end uh, to be what we want as well. So we can, the, the, the reduction here follows quite simply, that given a, a Turing machine, we, we perform this complicated reduction, and uh, we have a tile set such that M comma W um, is going to be in ATM uh, if and only if uh, the, the tile set has a match. Right? Any questions on this proof so far? Very unrigorous, very unserious, but that's sort of the nature of, uh, of how complicated this argument is. Now that we've proven this uh, language is undecidable, what we've really proven is there exists a puzzle, a very simple puzzle. Like you could imagine this is a game maybe you played as kids or something, I don't know, like Go Fish or something. It's, it's, it's very simple. You could imagine uh, that many other similar games are undecidable. And now that we've proven, in some sense, this, although this is a reduction from ATM, uh, this is, seems like a much simpler problem than uh, ATM itself. What you've done here is you there's just enough structure within the problem of PCP for you to encode uh, the transition function of a Turing machine. So any structure, any kind of thing that has the ability for you to encode the transition function of a Turing machine and force the computation to behave a certain way, turns out is enough for that class or that whole system to have undecidable problems, right? You may have seen Conway's Game of Life or something is Turing complete. These are all uh, Turing complete because they can encode something like a Turing machine within them. Same thing for this. This can encode a Turing machine within it in a, a not obvious way. Now that you've also now that we've proven PCP is undecidable, it's also true that uh, if you were to encode PCP into something else, you could prove that is then undecidable, and that's actually. Um, uh, much easier, it turns out. PCP has much easier structure, it appears, than the transition function of a Turing machine. Just, just given a set of tiles, have whatever system you're encoding to them reach the good or the bad, depending on if the tiles uh, accept it, uh, tiles had a match or not. Um, have you guys heard of the game Baba is You? Ba Baba? Baba, B-A-B-A. -B -A. Baba is You? It's, there's a recent paper in a sequence of YouTube videos, I'll have to share it, but basically he gives a Baba is You level where you're a little, this little mouse and you walk around the level and you have blocks that can uh, join rules together to change the rules of the game, right? He creates a Baba is You level that has a solution, like there's a way to reach the goal in the Baba is You level only if PCP has the PCP instance, the tile set has a match, right? So th there's a reduction similar here. Um, like, like, it, in class, I don't you maybe you can take it with me, but I proved Super Mario is NP complete. I, I gave a level that has a solution. Super Mario level has a solution only if SAT, a certain SAT instance has a solution. Similar here, similarly with this reduction. This is a simple problem like SAT that you can encode into other complicated uh, structures. And then you can prove those things all have undecidable problems with them. Right. 
All right. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Excuse me, on Thursday.